Welcome back to Humans in 5. This week I'm on my own and on a bit of a road trip. I'm currently in the United Kingdom. Back in Canada, we're about to wrap up Black History Month, which runs throughout February. So today, I'm going to chat about how we can tie together the experiences of Black peoples in the Americas with a bit of British history too. We're obviously all aware of the transatlantic slave trade, where various European powers forcibly abducted, displaced, and enslaved African people to do the labor colonial agents didn't want to do. The work of enslaved men, women, and children in the British Caribbean, Mauritius, and the Cape was responsible for lining the pockets of European people to a great degree. For example, it's estimated that 10 to 20 percent of Britain's wealthy have some link to slavery. It also set the stage for much of the disenfranchisement and inequality currently experienced by people of African and Indigenous descent in many parts of the world today. In this day and age, 401 years after the first slave ships arrived in the U.S. colonies, people are trying to find new ways to bring the story to life. Currently, on both sides of the Atlantic, the slave trade is often put out of sight and out of mind. In the UK in particular, researchers noticed that people sometimes viewed it as an American problem and didn't see their particular relationship to enslaved peoples or their descendants in the present. One group at University College London wanted to turn that tide and did so with the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project. So, for a bit of history, slavery was abolished in the British empires in 1833. That's not to say, however, that things were all fine and dandy after that. From the perspective of slave owners, they now found themselves without free human labor and were worried about all the money they'd lose from not being able to treat human beings as objects through which they could acquire more wealth. So, to sweeten the pot for slave owners, the British government decided to start a reimbursement scheme. Slaves were obviously not to be given any money, they were just supposed to be grateful for their freedom. But the government paid out money to slave owners so they would receive the lost earnings their slaves would have made for them in the course of their enslavement. In order to roll out this compensation scheme, the government had to make a list of all British people who owned slaves, as well as how many slaves were owned by each person so they could be properly compensated. Now, we tend to assume that most slave owners lived on plantations or something like that. However, it turns out they were all over the British Isles. It's worth remembering that up until this point, slaves weren't considered as people or equal people under British law. They had their personhood stripped away. They could be traded like property. So many ordinary British people invested in slaves. This was not just an activity for the aristocracy. Middle class people were also attracted by the prospect of taking the earnings of another human being who was worked to the bone while they didn't have to lift a finger. Abolition movements had been growing in popularity in the early 1800s, but there were still many people who were invested in and involved with this brutal scheme. So, the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project has taken this database of former slave owners and turned it into an interactive map. You can look up the names and former addresses of slave owners who lived in the UK in the 1830s. In searching the database, the pervasiveness of this system of forced human labor becomes clear. For example, my grandmother comes from a village in Bedfordshire. A little before my grandmother's grandparents were born, a local vicar claimed over 3,500 pounds in compensation for slaves as a trustee for a slave owner at the time of emancipation. We usually don't think of country vicars as slave owners or as people negotiating the trade of human beings, but this database reminds us that anyone could be associated with the use of human lives and human labor for their gain. This becomes even more close to home for me as the Reverend made a claim in St. Vincent, an island where the other side of my family have a history of enslaved peoples in the Caribbean at the same time period the vicar made his claim. Ultimately what this shows is that for British people, slavery was much closer to home than we tend to think. If you're British or have British roots, I recommend searching your address or region to see who in your area or family tree may have had ties to this scheme. You might be surprised at what you find. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Humans in 5. And don't forget to subscribe!